Let's please bring in John Hodge from 3downnation.com. Obviously, we're going to do a CFL Combine wrap with John. Thanks, John, for coming on, by the way. And how awesome was it that the CFL was in your backyard? But can I ask you this? See, uh, NFL owners moving to ban the hip drop tackle today. J.J. Watt saying he doesn't even know what it is. My guy, Zig Fricasse at NFL, uh, NFL Radio goes, maybe they should ban Thursday night football. That'll be good for player safety, too. Do you have any take on this today? I mean, not particularly. I, I think anytime you change the rules to any sport, there's going to be a challenging adjustment period. So whatever you do as the NFL, hopefully they do a good job of explaining, right? Whatever this exact rule change is going to be, they show players proper examples and allow teams to educate those players properly. Otherwise, the first couple weeks of the season are uh, inevitably, right, going to be controversial. There's going to be hip drop tackles that are not uh, penalized. There's going to be hip drop tackles that probably weren't hip drop tackles that are going to be penalized. It's, it's not dissimilar, I think, to when the CFL banned the horse collar tackle, right? There's going to be an adjustment period, and uh, hopefully the NFL makes that transition as, as, as best they can. Good answer. Good answer. I feel like family feud. Good answer. That's like the CFL when it banned the tourist hit. Nobody even knew what, what that was. So um, leave it up to that. They need to explain it properly. And 15 players were hurt because of this last season in the NFL, we understand. So hopefully it's what's best for the game. Now, enough about that. You spent all weekend at the CFL, all week at the CFL Combine. Maybe on the topic of rules changes, do you really believe that we have some significant ones coming in the CFL this year from what you heard? Well, the rules committee had, had essentially convened by the time the CFL Combine got underway. So I did run into Solomon Elamimian and uh, Brian Ramsey from the CFLPA. Also, Adam Big Hill, of course, active middle linebacker for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, uh, who was there as a PA rep. Randy Ambrosi was there uh, just uh, the Tuesday night and then uh, into the Wednesday. Uh, it's not something that I, I poked around about a whole heck of a lot because reportedly the committee didn't decide anything, at least as of now. Personally, yeah. I'm of the opinion that the, the game is, is more or less fine the way it is. Though I do think it should be said that when it comes to big play returns, missed, if you look, if you look at the actual numbers for big play returns and, and specifically return touchdowns, you know, missed field goals are massive, right? Uh, punt returns, you know, th there are a lot of them. And then, and then kickoff return is like a very, very distant third, right? Kickoffs. I'm not going to call a non-play. They're they certainly a non-play in the NFL. They are not a non-play in the CFL, but they do produce the fewest big plays. So I, I guess I would call myself an agnostic if I were to offer my personal opinion. Doesn't particularly <laughs> offend me if the kickoff changes. I'm also fine leaving leaving it the way it is. Isn't it interesting though the difference? And you would know this more than anybody. The difference between. American rules, NFL football, and CFL football. It's like night and day. It's like they just call themselves the same thing, but that's about it. Like there was only 20% of NFL kickoffs were returned last year. The CFL would be exponentially higher than that. Like it is a major change. What, where they are similar is player safety, and that's the one thing the CFL is very, very serious on, and I give Randy Ambrosi credit for that. I think that's because he was a player. He is serious about it. What's your report on the combine? Uh, if it wasn't as much rule changes, what was, John? I mean, I, I'm a big nerd for the player evaluation, so I, I was thoroughly enjoying getting the opportunity to inter interact with players, interview players, watch them perform on the field. The, uh, the Winnipeg Soccer North Federation, the building where the on-field portions took place, got rave reviews from personnel people, from the players themselves. They really enjoyed the surface. And then there was a great 360 degree viewing area around the field that made it really easy to uh, you know, watch everything live. I filmed a number of the reps myself so I can watch them later. I've yet to watch the, the CFL.ca live stream, but I'm looking forward to doing that on replay um, later today, if not tomorrow, just to see more of the receiver uh, DB one-on-ones. I was paying very close attention to the O-line, D-line one-on-ones simply because you, know, you, you don't get as much exposure to, to those guys as you maybe do on the college film or, or you do uh, in the media. Um, obviously, offensive linemen don't have stat sheets. Receivers, you know, you can look at the stat sheet, you can look at the measurables, and I'm not saying that that's all the scouting you do, but, but you can kind of project and understand what a guy is. Offensive line is a different story. So those are the guys I was paying most close attention to. And uh, again, I'm looking forward to getting the opportunity to review more of their film over the coming 
days and weeks as I work towards my next mock draft. Um, as for the combine itself, I mean, again, the, the, the Winnipeg Soccer North Federation building got a great review. Uh, the Hotel Fort Gary was a lot of fun. And uh, it was great. I, all in all, I, I thought it was a great event. Um, the combine underwent a change last year to kind of expand it, have more on-field practices. Uh, the only complaint I would have really is, uh, and these are largely unavoidable things, is a number of players, uh, I don't know if they just went too intense on day one, but a lot of players were nicked up for day two and three of practice. And then something that is probably unavoidable is a bunch of players caught a stomach flu the third day. And so uh, the numbers were a little thin. But again, that's, uh, I don't think that's something you can blame on anyone in particular. It's just more of a, a, a bad, poor happenstance than anything else. It's really interesting that you talk about the measurables and you being a nerd for it. I mean, my dad was a scout for 26 years in the NHL. He was that type of nerd. So I know that it's a science, but what I also know is it's an inexact science, but it's still very important to do, right? It's not going to tell you who the best player is going to be, but it's going to even give you a much better idea than if you didn't have a combine, right? And have the opportunity to do interviews and do the measurables. Yeah, and I mean, the, the combine, I don't think, is going to drastically change anybody's board if players have been doing, or pardon me, if, if scouts and teams have been doing the work on these players, there shouldn't be any crazy surprises. But obviously, watching film, you're, you're not able to get maybe a really good sense of a player's measurables. I do think there's value in that just to kind of set a baseline. Um, the, the U Sports prospects, for instance, have East West Bowl where they do all these testing events the year before. And I've talked to scouts who've said, look, if a guy at East West, let's say, does 12 reps on the bench, um, I don't particularly care what he does, you know, after that, because he's a receiver and 12 reps, frankly, is good enough. But if he comes to the combine and does nine, then that's a pretty clear indication that over the last 12 months, right, or whatever it is, he hasn't been hitting the gym, right? He's not been taking this seriously. If he does 12 at East West and he comes back, and he does 17, then it's like, holy smoke, this guy is not resting on his laurels. This is a guy who is a gym rat who's going to be there. So that's, I think, a big part of the testing mattering. And then the more important side of it, I think, is the interview process, right? There are players in this draft, and this is going to be the norm moving forward, uh, for better or worse, from the NCAA side of things anyway, where they've played at literally three or even four different schools. And teams want to ask those questions of, why did you move here? Why did you move there? Hey, you went to this new school and had no production. What was the story there? Hey, you were reportedly injured in 2021. What really happened? Tell us your side of the story. And so those interviews and the answers that, that players are, are, are able to give, I think, are arguably the more important thing. Because oftentimes in these draft rooms, you, you have a situation where you've got two players at the same position. Measurables are more or less the same. The film grade is more or less the same. And it comes down to who is the better fit right for this team which player's personality do we like the most which one is going to be the most fun to spend time with or who is going to be the one who riles everybody up and serves as a leader right those are the types of decisions that teams need to make because at the end of the day right if if you're looking for a, a sixth round pick or a seventh round pick uh, a player's personality could be the difference between whether or not you take them yeah well it sounds to me from what i've read at three down I've had a Joe, a Joe on this show. I was following the combine. Sounds like he's the next Deron Carter. Let me ask you this. Would you take a Joe, a Joe based on what you've seen in the last week? Well, I, I should clarify. I, I didn't speak to a Joe, a Joe personally. My colleague, JC Abbott, did that interview and wrote a great column on it. Um, certainly, it was a disappointing performance. Um, we're going to be uh, publishing our, our risers and fallers at three down over the next couple of days. Uh, Joe Joe will be a faller. Uh, that's simply because he came in on the top 20 scouting bureau rankings, and those rankings admittedly can be a little bit flawed. Uh, but he was still somebody who was recruited to Clemson, right? Coming out of high school, he did go to the States for, for the tail end of his high school career. But, you know, he was a 224 pound receiver who was part of the number three ranked. Uh, recruiting class in the entire NCAA that year when he went to the Tigers. And then over the course of his career, he went to lesser and lesser programs, eventually ending up at the junior college level at Garden City this past year where he played some tight end. And then he comes to the combine at 212 pounds. That's, that's less than he weighed coming out of high school. And he was the slowest of all the receivers there with a 4.85 40-yard dash. Now, 
are there stories of players having terrible combines and then having solid careers? The answer is yes. And I'm not writing off a of Joe a Joe. Uh, would I draft him at the right spot? Absolutely. I think, however, the issue was a Joe a Joe is coming into the draft, or pardon me, coming into the combine, looking to show that he was a, a second round pick, maybe, you know, maybe a third round guy. And the reality is that's just not the case anymore. This is a really deep receiver class. There's no reason for anybody to reach on somebody. To me, he looks now more like a, a late round pick. Big talent for sure and uh, fun to watch. John, thanks for this insight. Keep up the great work. Love and three down as we always do, man. Thanks for uh, fitting, uh, fitting us in today. Thanks for having me, Rod. John Hodge from 3downnation.com.